you all for coming out tonight. Um, really, we've set this up so I keep turning this way. Um, hi, people on this side. Um, I'm Dan Rosenberg. I host the Visiting Writer Series, and I would like to welcome you to our latest reading, which is to celebrate the newly released book, Pricking, by Jessica Cuello. Um, before I forget, Anything else? Um, I want to thank Niska, whose ongoing financial support makes this reading series possible, and thank Wells, and thank all of you for coming. Particularly, so many of you are like recurring, returning faces, and it's it's lovely to see you all again. Um, bureaucratic things before I get going. We have available for purchase today. Um, the book, Hot Off the Presses, breaking which Jessica is buying, and she, as of a half hour ago, has the capacity to accept credit card purchases, so that was a fun moment of tech support, <laughs> and um, these are $15 tonight, right, and Jessica will be happy to sign them and talk to you and all that jazz, and this is a broadside of one of the poems from the book, done by our own Richard Kabler in the Book Art Center, and for people who know about letterpress printing, Come up and take a good look because he's done things that don't seem like they should be possible on this. The sort of halo effect of the white type, it's its beautiful and um, shocking and striking and they're all also signed by the poet and numbered and all done by hand and gorgeous so come check them out and they will be available. They are $20 retail and $10 tonight because you're lovely people and we care about you. Um, so this is, this is the stuff at the end. Um, and I, I am going to introduce Jessica, but before, before I do, sort of in light of recent events, there was just a, a poem that I wanted to share with you all um, as I've been processing what's going on in our country for the past couple of days. Um, and this is called Good Bones, it's by Maggie Smith, and I think it's sort of deeply relevant for, for today. And it's made me feel a little bit better, so. Good Bones. Life is short, though I keep this for my children. Life is short, and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways. A thousand deliciously ill-advised ways I'll keep for my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. For every bird, there's a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake. Life is short and the world is at least half terrible, and for every kind stranger, there is one who would break you, though I keep this from my children. I'm trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real shithole chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. Um, yeah, so that's an aside. And totally not incongruous given the subject matter of, of Jessica's new book, so I hope that doesn't seem like a grotesque transition, but I wanted to uh, just read her bio and then invite her up, and then there'll be a brief time for some questions, if you had some, that um, Jessica can feel, which I'm looking at her right now, realizing I didn't run that by her, but there we go. All right, nothing like being on the spot. Um, so she's the author of three chapbooks, My Father's Bargain, By Fire, and Curie, and her first full-length collection, Breaking, was just published by Tiger Bark, which is housed right up here in Syracuse. Rochester. Rochester, sorry. And still woo, right? <laughs> Rochester. Um, she won the 2013 New Letters Poetry Prize, the Lumina Poetry Contest, and uh, Salt and Stall Writing Fellowship. And um, also, this is this is the first book, and when this came out, that was the bio. And then her second collection, Hunt, just won the 2016 Washington Prize from the Word Word. 
Um, she attended Barnard College in Columbia, and she currently teaches French in Syracuse, New York. And I'm going to get out of the way. Please welcome Jessica. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Dan, thanks for showing me this beautiful campus. I'm going to take us through history. We're going to go back several centuries, and we're going to be looking at women women who have been overlooked is our theme. And I'm going to the 13th century, and I'm going to start with poems about a 13th century Cathar woman called Esclarmand de Croix. And if you don't know who the Cathars were, they were a heretical Christian sect in the Languedoc region of France. Um, it's like in the southwest, and they were all burned alive at the end. Um, because of their beliefs, they had more progressive beliefs. And these are her poems. <clears throat> the Births, 1186. When I was pregnant again, a fever thinned me out. My sweat stopped nothing. The shoots pushed up, each one a consort to my sickness. And the unborn, who usually burrowed against my ribs, spread out, her arm and arc across my belly. I don't know how old I was, barely a woman. I told myself to remember the pattern of stars, the yellow flowers, the tremor of my thigh. When the baby girl could sit up, her hair like loose fur, I put the details together. I could not find the sense in them. I bit into my arm when she was born. She came out pink and gold. Her eyes remained in the other world for days. The midwife spread the placenta out. See here, she pointed. Another birth was swallowed. I see it all the time. After my sixth, I locked the door. In the fields, cows chewed grass, their backs to me. The natural world is hard and dirt. I want to scrape it off. Conversion, June 1204. The sun turns back in time my hair and hands. God reversed me. See my legs jogged up the hill. The hot wind is his mouth around me. When they set the table, my appetite is new. My little teeth set on the bread like a baby deer. I could not wait to sleep and then wake up and sleep again. She also founded a school for girls. If I had a favorite student, I would not tell. She is a solitude with us, gold with ribbon hair. We braid it thickly in a crown. She cries. She hardly speaks. She blushes if we touch her head. We observe the blue gold order of her loom. Ak means yes. We live in the land of yes. And that region of France, Languedoc, is short for Long of Ak, language of Ak, which was the Occitan language. Now I think it's a lotion. Fancy, a really fancy lotion. <laughs> is Massacre at Béziers. Um, there's a lot of violence in this section. Um, this was a town during the Albigensian Crusades. The Crusaders came to the town and they said, how do we know which people to kill? And the Pope said, kill them all. God will know his own. We returned to Béziers. We upended the unhinged door, buried the limbs, spread dirt on the oily pools. Six times I labored in this world and saved my grown children. I placed the head of the girl with the girl. Her mother wears a strand of bread from looting. When we had cleaned up best we could, we sat apart in a field. No one made food. We were afraid of taste. Foot of Mont 
Mont Segur. Mont Segur is a big mountain in France. You can go see it. And they used it as a refuge. The last Cathars, when they were threatened, they went up there and hung out, and they were eventually caught there and burned. A rumor said we crept in and dug like animals, a hollow for the grail. The friars weren't listening at Albi or Verfeit. We buried nothing. I think of the spaces where we lived. Landscape is a corner of my eye, papery like dry ashen leaves. The crusaders brought a map with blue cut into the outline of our Languedoc. I touched the lightweight edge where our caves would be. We worshiped in the walls. I loved to study the child's head with a light touch on the ear, her patient stare while I combed the long hair back, breathed the cold cutting air and buried the afterbirths. I knew there was no mistake about the body and routine. God did not send us out, but back. The most physical of all, I rocked as in a body what I felt a boat must be. I see cliffs transparent, how grainy water is. And finally, I watch the iron density of flame. All night, sun sets on the town. Easily, they fit us in the circle. We are the last of us. This will be the last Cathar poem. And this one was for her brother, who fought against the Crusaders. Pun for my brother, Raymond Roger, Count of Bois. While I was finding room to hide refugees and heal the sick, you were present. We never lacked for things to do and moved in the self-importance of our birth. Once pinning up my reddish hair, I paused and thought of your boyish head. We were two foxes from the last litter of our kind. Our tongues were south. When you were before the church, half-dressed and shackled, I couldn't look. The world did not seem long enough in history. No, it was done. Our land, our tongue. At the end, you said your only wish was that you killed more of them. So I'm going to move up two centuries to 1400s. These are all in France. To Joan of Arc. And everyone knows who she is. And I'll read the broadside poem that came out so beautifully. Jeanne d'Arc thinks of her virginity. <clears throat> the calf won't get born. The cow moans and father unbends the leg stuck in her flesh. I pretend not to know that he told my brothers to drown me if I left. A child is heavy on the feet, clinging with an open mouth. A virgin can prophesy for God, but once a mother, nothing else. And I know, I know you're familiar with her story. Um, so after she helped the king um, get crowned and led the armies into battle, all of the bishops turned on her and the king turned on her and betrayed her and sold her to the English. And this poem is The Bishop's Turn. It was not vanity, the certainty in my voice, the sword, the horse, three of us moving without a seam. Two years, the sweetness of a path, always sure, God in my ear, the English out, the English out. This poem is entirely made up, the next poem is entirely made up of questions she was asked at her trial. Who sewed the words into your banner? Did you ask your saints if, by virtue of your banner, you would win every battle? Which helped the other more, you, your banner, or your banner, you? What do you love more, your banner or your sword? Did your voices tell you to make the banner? Did your men believe that your banner had special charms? Who made the banner? And this is a very tiny poem, and it's her response about her banner. And she, there's a reference to the fact that she was illiterate, she couldn't read. 
Trina Liddy in response. I do not know A from B. More than the sword, the lily sewn on ivory. I can't tell A or B. Fringed with silk, a field where our Lord holds the world. I can't read A or B. I loved my banner more. Ten minutes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm not done. <laughs> um, this is her executioner. God will not forget what I did. In the tavern I gripped a glass. Condensation smeared my hand. The oil and sulfur I'd applied would not burn her entrails. A heart intact and full of blood, her little cross of wood. I swept her ashes in the same. And this will be the last Joan of Arc poem, and this is her mother, Isabel. When you broke the marriage contract, you were my lanky girl. I dressed your torso by the fire, picked grasses off your hair. I hear your humming while I work, as if you left it in the timbers of our home. The shifting of the heat and cold coax it out, and you are here. I had to hold your father back, he dreamed you left with soldiers for the war. I put my hands on him, held in our loss. You were not ours. We all knew what you'd seen. We'd seen it too. Village burnt, cattle gone. And now I'm moving up to 1580 to Lorraine, France. And this is a woman I invented um, during the witch hunts in persecution of Protestant Reformation. So this was an imaginary person who I imagined as a midwife. Midwife. The afterbirth was red and warm. Then I sewed her, and she was empty. Nearby, the baby was curled and breathing with nothing, severed. Eyes not seen, and light is much more than we want much more abrasive than we knew. All of us began in a room from water, from the silk and iron. What room is she? Walls that go when they hold no one. Apprentice. Soon she would have learned to strip the membrane near the womb, one finger to set the labor on. Then she would have learned to turn the baby in the mother's water, a sailing planet in her hands. I've never read this one out loud. Let's see how it goes. Evidence before the court. An idea I never, never threaded, a loop to take away a man, I never, never, an apple in my bucket smelling of the devil. So in the narrative that's not told in the poems, uh, the midwife has a nickname, the cat, and there are cats in the poems. And this is the cat. A delay each time they speak my given name. Marguerite, Marguerite, I'm called the cat, I say. Law in the blood, stopped by a thread. Law in the breasts before they break with water milk, the silver food. God's law twisted, God's law of small gums. They asked about the little tooth. Tiny gray that broke and dropped into the dirt. Why did I have it in a tin? For 17 years, she slept against my thighs, purred on my chest when a child died. There were a lot of cats killed during the witch hunts, which is why they had the plague also, because the rats. I'm going to read three more. And these are from the new book. And the new book that comes out this spring is, essentially it's a feminist interpretation of Moby Dick. So it's sort of the absent feminine 
So Dan has said that your reading will be good in the spring, some of you. So, and I only have three of these. So the first one, and they correspond to the chapters. The first one is Loomings. It's the very first chapter in the book. And it's called The Wife at Home. The body makes a sea, a sea for mine, for the stay behind. When the men go, and ropes clatter at the dock, we hear them off, off, and inside my tumbling sea, a beast rolls over on the clay bottom. I sense her lovesick eye in the corner, cordoned on all sides, her beastie eye where the rage pools in the umbilical silt and moon. I subdue her trance and claw her dreamy eye, shrill with disappointment and left to survive. There's almost no women in my dick, if you haven't read it yet. But. And this is a poem from the whale's perspective. And it's about the fountain, the chapter's called The Shoot of Water. How the whale hides. For an hour or more without drawing a breath. For an hour or more below the surface. A waiting black spot in thick water, a mammal. Breathe only in the Arctic. Breathe only when the light is gone. Breathe only when his face recedes. His ship backtracks its invisible line. If you don't breathe, you can't be found. If you don't breathe, you won't feel. If you don't breathe, the hand passes. The st skin stays clean, not pierced. If you don't breathe, the remora keeps swimming. So, okay, this poem is moving me. Oh, sorry. I haven't read this before. If you don't breathe, the remora keeps swimming. The harpoon rests, the rope stays coiled. If you don't breathe, no fountain, no spray, no vapor. No, there she blows, no stinging. Once I approached, once curious, once open like a lily, once before you ruined everything. We're all tired of your marauding. So that fits this week. <laughs> and this is my last poem. This poem is in uh, is about the character Pip, who was former slave cabin boy, and it's the castaway, and he is left in the midst of the vast sea, and he thinks he is left there to die because the ship has gone off chasing a whale, which is worth more money than Pip. The sea keeps his body up and his mind spills a liquid way into the dark and his face with the blue where the earth falls off, where God is not, only faceless angels slither gill, worth less than the whale lost, but born to a mother casket dark he woke to who was there, no one, who was ripped from him, a boy, or who the sea. Why must he invisible, his feet turned white, too white, like sugar in water receding, worth less than the whale lost, but born and took up space, a hand, pinprick, next heat. So these poems are kind of intense, so I'm going to keep it short, because they are intense, I think. It's enough blood. I find it easier to latch on to things. I, it's just where I, I gravitate. Um, 
than my own personal. I mean, I've written a lot of personal poems, but I don't. Tend, I haven't published them. So for whatever reason, I like having a mythical um, bone or backbone to the poems. And I, I do a lot of research um, because I'm a nerd that way. So it makes me feel <laughs> comfortable. So like when I did Marie Curie, I read like six books about Marie Curie. <laughs> And then none of the stuff I learned really was in the poems, but um, I love Moby Dick. I've read it ten times. And um, but there's very little of the book in the poem, so it's floating around somewhere in the subconscious, and it I think goes into the poems. But I don't, I don't really write historical poems. It's yeah, that answers. No, it's really interesting. Yeah. It is, and it sounds kind of spooky and yeah. mystical, weird, but the Cathar poems, um, in my old classroom, there were these all these old photo books from the 50s, and I found these photos of the region. And I'm a French teacher, but I've actually never been to Languedoc. And um, I just kept staring at the photos, and then one day I was going for a run, and I like heard, you know, the conversion poem came on the run. So. There's something very intimate for me to the poems. They're um, they're not like this happened, right. and they're not conforming in any kind of historical way. Right. Yeah, they're meant to be deeply personal, mm -hmm. so as much as I can imagine. But I I believe in the imagination for understanding other. You know, I've always believed that. So, yeah. um, in one of the poems, you said. Just imagine a whole person. And do you imagine a whole person, or do you imagine part of the person or the life from that perspective? How do you it's know an interesting you question because I, I don't even know what other poets do, but I def, I see. I mean, there's poems come to me for, for for rhythm and sound, like I hear the music. But I definitely saw these worlds. Mm -hmm. Like I saw the water and the house and the cat, and um, it was very real. You know, it sounds like I should be a prose writer, but I'm, I'm horrible at prose. You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's an imagined world that's, it's almost exists outside of the poems, and then the poems borrow to tell the poem. Yeah. How long do you sit with that person before you? <laughs> Is it like an instant thing, or do you spend a couple days, hours? I don't know. I, um, I'm a public school teacher. Right. And I have two kids, and I cook every night. <laughs> so my poems are probably very short for that reason. And maybe when I quit teaching, they're going to become very long. So how I sit with things is, um, I, I don't even know how my, my brain, it's a mess. Yeah. Like, it's a mess, and I don't, I understand. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> So I mean, I do. I do. I'm very disciplined. I'm an extremely disciplined person. That you know, I carve out time daily to read and write. Um, and my kids are really great about my my door shut. They don't bug me. Um, you know, I'm a little selfish that way. But a lot of it occurs. You know, I'll jot down notes in faculty meetings, especially. You know, <laughs> so I can't think of anything less muse-like than I am. But. <laughs> Have you always written? Did you write in school? Yeah. <laughs> so from an early age. Yeah. I mean, the Marie Curie stuff was with me. She was this iconic figure from like age five. Really? And um, I remember reading her biographies when I was little, and I wrote about her in my diary, Marie Curie. Oh. <laughs> and then I read some Susan Sontag essays. And then I kept, it kept reading, you know, it's when you find a new word, and then you hear everyone use it. Um, 
I, apparently, I think there must have been some little girl, Marie Curie, biography that many women read and, you know, was uh, there, it was in us. Everybody's heard of Marie Curie, but they may not know the story. Uh, can you say a little bit more about her life? Um, I mean, her life, her personal life is incredible. You know, she, this, I wrote this poem a long time ago, but I mean, um, you know, she, one of the things that was fascinating was she had an affair with a married man and she had won the Nobel Prize that year. She's the only woman in physics. And they told her not to come get the prize. You know, people were sending her hate mail. Um, and Albert Einstein stood up for her. Like all these strange little stories um, of her life in Poland. She wasn't allowed to go to school, so she had this secret university. Um, very high work ethic. Um, and then how she died. Well, she died from radium poisoning, which she denied till the end of her life was dangerous. And at the Curie Institute, you know, even when she was alive, they were already telling people to take precautions and protect themselves. And she, she was in denial. She was just not, not going to make you sick um, until the very end. She didn't accept that it was. And now I think all of her um, instruments are still radioactive. Yeah. And you can't touch them. And how and, old was she at the process? I just use the biography for the poetry. I'm like a terrible, I don't remember. Yeah. You know. Maybe a related question, just because, as you know, the, there's some of these students are going to be studying uh, Moby Dick next semester, and some are also going to be studying Berryman. And hearing you talk about how the poems come to like rhythm and sound first, a thing that was noticeable to me in the diversity of voices that you were inhabiting is there's a definite through line. There's definitely like your voice mm -hmm. overlapping with these different persona. And I was wondering like, how do you like, how closely do you want to inhabit these these voices that you're speaking from versus just like um, using them as like a very thin mask to tell a different kind of of poem? Do you know what I mean? Like you're not trying to be Joan of Arc in these poems. I wouldn't try right. to do that. You know, and with the Moby Dick, I wouldn't even dream of competing with Melville and right. Ramon. Um, but there, I mean, I'm not pretending to be Joan of Arc, certainly. Um, I like living and, you know. Um, <laughs> but I do think that those figures resonate with people. And I do think those stories are not very present in literature, even though Joan of Arc is probably written about more than anyone in history, um, her story is very epic, and there's not very much human farm girl with the cows. Um, but she was a real person. She was a real girl. So I, I mean, I think that human part is not very present for women to. Is that part? Is there like an ethics to your poetics in that regard? Because you keep giving voice to these women coming out of context where they have been, and then historically where they have been silenced, or, you know. There's not, there's not like a moral ethics. There's a gravitational, it's more of a gravitational goal than, you know, so. And I think what is emerging Books and broadsides are up here available. Come check them out. If you're interested in the broadside, talk to me. If you're interested in the book, talk to Jessica. And please hang out and chat informally. Thank you all so much again for coming. And
good luck with uh, the next bit of the semester. Oh, okay. Yeah, the next four years. Oh, God. All right. Can I just ask you about